in Acts 1. Acts is by uh, Luke, who writes the Gospel of Luke to Theophilus, his good friend uh, and patron. And uh, Acts 2 is Luke, volume 2, um, to Theophilus. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. That's an important phrase, the promise of the Father. It portends the fact that he had said he was going to do something <laughs> significant. And so Jesus is referring to that promise. Um, back in Luke 24, when Jesus is talking to the disciples there about this, he says to them, don't leave Jerusalem until the promise of the Father comes upon you. And so we're going to find out why in Acts chapter 1, uh, you know, Luke volume 2. So wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, meaning John the baptizer, known far and wide as John the Presbyterian, he sprinkled everybody he went to. Just kidding. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because that's what they expected the Messiah was going to do. Get rid of the Roman forces and uh, establish Israel as his own kingdom, as if it had been under King David. And uh, Jesus, of course, says to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You understand? We have moved suddenly from the Old Testament perspective. Lord, what will you do with Israel, your beloved? We are moving quickly from what will you do, Lord, with Israel to what will you do with the earth? <laughs> what will you do with the entire population of the earth? You will establish a church is what you will do and you will found it upon the power of the blood of Christ and the ministry will come by means of the Spirit of God through His church, through His people. In this case, of course, He's speaking directly to His apostles and others. You'll be my witnesses. The word is very close. It is actually a word that comes out of the Greek word for martyrs. <laughs> to be a witness is to die to yourself. And sometimes, just frankly, to die. And so, when he had said these things, I'm in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, the son of James, and all of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Interestingly enough, incidentally, that word for brothers is plural, of course, but it has a connotation that is not necessarily translated correctly here in our translations. That is to say, it is meant to be talking about siblings, okay? And it includes Adelphoi, it includes the sisters that you may have. And we know from Mark chapter 6, by the way, that Jesus, there, there's four brothers of Jesus listed there. 
and, and his sisters. We don't know how many, but the word is plural, his sisters. We assume at least two. Uh, so Mary and Joseph had a number of children after Jesus' birth. But in any case, all that family, along with Mary, his mother, is gathered in the upper room for this time of prayer and accord with one another. Why are they so intent on this? Because Jesus has been present with them after Passover, after his resurrection, some 40 days. Some 40 days speaking to, uh, speaking to Israel and to his disciples and to those believers who were with him. And in that time period, he has told them, stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. He means the Spirit of God will come upon them. You understand? Of course you do. And what's waiting is once he's ascended and gone, there's still ten more days until the second feast after Passover, the Pentecost event. Acts 2 is coming. The Spirit of God is coming with power. He's going to do odd things, maybe strange things, mostly godly things, when it comes to what will happen with the church, filling them up with his power and presence. Did these believers in Christ, his personal team of apostles and disciples, some 120 of them now in this upper room together, including his mother and his family, who incidentally, some of that family never did quite come to surrender their lives to their own half-brother, to Jesus, until after the resurrection. One of the appearances that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians 15, of the six appearances, is that he met with James after his resurrection, meaning Jesus' half-brother, James. Um, and so James obviously had come to faith in Christ. And from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ came with him to me. I guess you would too, wouldn't you? <laughs> and so in any case, James was won the hard way, but he came. And so they're all gathered now. There's 120 in the upper room praying because in 10 days will come the event of Pentecost. They're literally fasting and praying to what will happen in that event. They know it will be a life changer. They know it will be a world changer event. So they're praying. Now, the Holy Spirit has to come. Um, and the Great Commission um, is the last chapter of Matthew. I want to take you there for just a moment. We'll be right back in Acts 1 soon. But in Matthew 28, the last chapter of the book of Matthew, um, Jesus meets after the resurrection with um, a number of those who were believers upon him, including his disciples, his, his close 11 disciples left. Uh, in, in Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. This is uh, probably that appearance that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians 15, it was Jesus appears to, as Paul puts it, more than 500 brothers um, on, uh, on a mountain in Galilee. And so all these people were gathered. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's a wonderful commission, a great commission. However, at the end of Luke, and now in Acts chapter 1, what he is busy saying to them is, don't go. Here's the commission, don't go. Here's what you're supposed to do with your lives. Reach the world, preach the gospel, right? In fact, he says, uh, in terms of the witnessing, they're going to start in Jerusalem, obviously, because that's where they're sitting, and in Judea, which is that principality around Jerusalem, and in Samaria, which is on further north, and to the end of the earth. That's exactly, by the way, how the book of Acts lays out where they will go to preach the gospel. Now, <laughs> but don't go. You're going to be my witnesses, and it's going to be wonderful, but don't do it until the power of the Spirit of God comes upon you. Well, no, no Spirit of God yet upon these believers? How'd they get there? Jesus must have had really beautiful eyes. 
He must have really been a winning personality, which is not what Isaiah 53 says he was. <laughs> he said, with his looks, nobody's going to be drawn to him. He's plain and simple. I can just see that now. The Jewish hook nose. Maybe, maybe beautiful brown eyes, I'm not sure. But it wasn't that winning personality that just drew folks to him. It was the Spirit of God, of course, moving through him in his, in his ministry. Now, um, <laughs> that being the case, um, look at John chapter 20 with me. John chapter 20. You all keeping up okay? You look a little, a little hazy. Um, if, if, if I'm this boring and you need to stand up, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to come right back there and shout in your ear. So stay awake during this message. Clear? <laughs> I'm not really mad. I'm just kidding with you. Well, I'm kind of mad. No, no, I'm just kidding. With you. In, John, in John chapter 20, after the resurrection, okay, um, it's still, however, Easter Sunday evening. And in verse 19, on the evening of that day, meaning Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Uh, why did he need to do that? Well, what he's doing is absolutely necessary, but it's part of the promise of the Lord upon his followers uh, Go with me again <laughs> to John chapter uh, 7. John chapter 7. And in this feast time that uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> go with me to uh, John chapter 7 and verse 37. He's been there that whole week and chapter 7 of John has traced him in his activities during this feast in Jerusalem right along at the beginning of the feast, at the middle of the feast, now at the end of the feast, the last day, the great day in verse uh, 37. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, meaning, of course, the Holy Spirit's presence, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Spirit of God's waiting, waiting. Jesus knew all about the mighty presence of the Spirit of God upon him, but his disciples, well, this is why when Jesus would say some things to them, they forgot a day later. Odd, isn't it? He told him he was going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die and rise again after three days. He told him three times, right over their heads. Sometimes I think I'm, as I'm preaching, that's what's happening with my message because, because people are doing something else, you know. Um, and um, so I'm just simply saying that if if your thoughts cannot get centered, it's because there's an absence of the Spirit of God. <laughs> if you would like to take that personally, good, because I meant that just as personally as I could. An absence of the Spirit of God. And so, as the Spirit of God comes, people connect finally with the Word of God. I was, uh, came to Christ as, a, as, a, as an older teenager and... Um, the Bible that I had in hand, which my parents had given me from graduation from the eighth grade. <laughs> and believe me, it looked just like new. <laughs> I, had, I, I hadn't read that thing much because I couldn't understand it. 
Well, it was King James Version for one thing. I'm sorry, all of you King James aficionados. But the truth of the matter is, you know, when we go to a foreign land and we, and we translate the scriptures, we translate it into the language of the people who are to receive it and to read it and to understand it, and it has nothing to do with King James English. Believe me. We make it as updated as possible. So nobody worships, you know, 16th century English uh, when you're working with people in the Amazon or when you're working with people who have a, a need for a Bible in their own language. And believe me, they are desperate for it once they come to Christ. They are. So I was stuck with this King James Bible. I'm not saying stuck. I just couldn't understand it. That's all. And I, I would try. I would try. I started going to church, you know, uh, every Sunday. That's what people do when they come to Christ. I don't know why people who think they've come to Christ can't figure this out, that you need to be in church. But I'm just telling you, um, when I came to Christ, church was very important. And so when, it wasn't the day before, but the day after it was. So I opened my little King James Bible. Um, it was uh, Chinese to me. And um, I, odd. And so I went to the little pastor who, in the church where I had come to Christ, and I said, you know, I, I don't get this. Uh, this. This doesn't make any sense to me. And he said, oh, Holy Spirit problem. <laughs> so, um, no, no, it's my problem. It's, I've got the, no, he said, no, it, the Spirit of God will help you figure it out. Well, when will he do that? <laughs> and he said, well, you pray about it? Well, of course, no, it hadn't occurred to me. Pray about this because he will open your mind to understand the scriptures as you're reading them. Wow. So I prayed that way. And, and you know what happened? It, it was amazingly clear. <laughs> Just a day later, it was amazingly clear. I couldn't put it down. I started reading it all the time then because it was connecting with me. I could understand it. Now, you may be sitting here wondering why you can't understand the Bible, why you never picked your Bible up. It's a Holy Spirit problem. You're doing something else. And instead of praying about this and letting God speak to you, your life and my life gets changed because of the Spirit of God, not because we just made up our mind to do better. It's changed because of a spiritual being, a spiritual person who walks with you, who speaks to you, who deals with you every day and every night of your life. For the rest of your life, he will never be silent. You will some days regret this a lot, but he will never be silent. And so he will talk with you all the time, but you have to quit doing something else. And quit ignoring that voice. Let him begin to speak with you. And so it was vastly important that Jesus connect the Spirit of God with these believers in him. They were already believers in him, obviously. But, you know, their position in life right now was hiding in the upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, lest they come get them and they kill them because they were certainly very capable, by the way, of killing them if it occurred to them they needed to wipe them out. So they were scared. Of course they were scared. And so the Spirit of God was able to come to them now. On this particular evening, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you think if Jesus Christ said, receive the Holy Spirit, they received the Holy Spirit? Do you think? Nobody else in the universe could impart the Spirit of God, but Jesus did. And so when they were standing here praying uh, back in Acts chapter 1, and, and Jesus said to them, you're going to be witnesses in all these places, but for heaven's sakes, do not leave town. <laughs> do not go out into the world without the power of the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? They already have the Holy Spirit. You, you breathed on them a few days ago and said, receive the Spirit of God. Did he come? Well, of course he came. Of course he came. Well, what is Jesus talking about here? More power. More power. More power. The kind of power that you uh, say to a mountain, get up and be moved. That's what Jesus said. If you have faith, you can do this without doubt. <laughs> Did any mountains move in Palestine during this period of time? Not a one. Not one. 
because he wasn't talking about the physical mountains. He was talking about the spiritual giants that you and I face all the time. And the way they'll move is because you pray. Get up and get out of my way. That's right. That's exactly how they move. That's how Satan moves away from you, you know? As James said to us, the pastor of the Jerusalem church in the book that he wrote, resist the devil, and what will he do? He will flee from you. Get up and run from you. Man, does that sound like the one who's beat the tar out of you for half of your life? Does that sound like the one who, you know, is just full of deception? And, and, and he can't speak the truth for anything? And all you have to do is resist him and he gets up and leaves? Really? Is that, is that who you're resisting? And apparently you resist him by saying, I'm following Jesus Christ. Get out of my way, you spiritual mountain. Get out of my way, Satan. <laughs> all of the struggles that we have are not just based upon Him, they're based upon the fact that we love Him, <laughs> that our body loves Him, that, that give, us, give us an addiction, any addiction, maybe just TV, I don't know, maybe just other addictions that you probably, well, there, there are so many that are far more serious, I realize that, but on the truth, the matter is, you get rid of one addiction, you get to deal with another addiction. Maybe you've noticed that. I have people once in a while tell me, well, I'm an addictive personality. I went through this, and I went through that, and I went through this, and now I can't get rid of smoking. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Bless your heart. I've had addicts tell me smoking was the worst thing they could get over. They did, it was, took the most effort. Well, maybe so, but the truth of the matter is, if you don't put your shoulder behind it, nothing's going to move. So you have to have the Spirit of God's presence. What does it mean to have this kind of power? You receive power when the Holy Spirit... This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Did I leave you behind in John 20? I'm in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The order of the book of Acts. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Has that happened? Well, it didn't happen in Peter's day. It didn't happen in Augustine's day in the 4th century. It didn't happen in St. Patrick's day. But it's happening now, isn't it? My goodness. Happening now. How in the world is that even possible that a group of people that actually pull themselves together? My God, I can't hardly keep you people awake. How, how in the world did people actually get up and get rid of themselves enough they could actually get on a boat and go to India in 1800 in order to preach Christ there knowing that they were probably not going to live a full life or a long life in the process? Who in the world gets that kind of gumption? Who in the world gets that kind of moxie, that kind of person? That kind of power. Who in the world? Yeah, who indeed? Who indeed? People who have been motivated by the Spirit of God. That may not be your problem, since you look awfully sleepy today. That may not be your problem. And, and, and truthfully, some days it's not my problem either. I'd rather sit down. I truly would. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, it's always the Spirit of God who motivates. It's always the Spirit of God who works with us, isn't it? Right? And so, if you've been doing other things, you know, worrying over whether the car is washed clean enough or not, you know, really important, life-changing things, or if you can get rid of all of that nonsense and actually get down to a place where you want your life to be changed, where you want somebody to speak to you who is real, who's already understands what you're going through, who has figured out that life is relatively short, but who understands where you and I are going, that person, I want that person <laughs> counseling me in my life. Don't you? Don't you? So, waiting for the promise, waiting for the power, and praying. I, uh, I think this witness to his resurrection, this understanding of his presence, of coming to a place where you want to be a witness is a really dynamic thing. 
I, I think that maybe people who say, I want to go be a witness for Christ, are in the extreme minority in the day in which we live. Don't you? Don't you? When, when you realize that people have given themselves over to many causes, my goodness, if you could just sort of harness the power that people gave to the Republican Party to attack the Capitol on January 6th, if you can sort of harness that power for the cause of Christ, can you imagine what could happen? Can you imagine what could happen? Or the, or, the, or the power that the Democratic Party seems to display in refusing to uh, believe that anybody's right but them. You know, if you could just kind of take that, that dynamic, that motivating mindset, and use it for the power of Christ, for the kingdom of God, can you imagine how many people would probably have their lives changed? And things would be different, if not in just this nation, probably all around the world. Um, a figure that I have in a read uh, came back, my goodness, it came from years ago, 10, 15 years ago. An article was written uh, quoting the fact that um, it was estimated that at that point, 95,000 people in communist China were coming to Christ every single day every single day how is that happening under a government that seems to want to refuse any involvement whatsoever with missionary activity for Christ's sake how in the world can that happen when they take the ministers who are trying to preach the gospel in China to already churches that were established by the government or at least allowed is what I'm trying to say, I guess, by the government, not the underground movement, which is mighty, which, by the way, they fear a great deal, but just the churches that are at the surface. If you went to Beijing and you, went and you said, I want to go uh, to a, a church service, where is the church? They, they're glad to take you to a very large congregation, more than one, in Beijing that they have allowed to flourish. They've allowed so that the world will know how sweet they are in terms of their personality. You know, the same people who killed all the missionaries after World War II <laughs> and threw out the rest of them uh, so that uh, communism would not have a problem with Christianity. And what they've done, of course, is sowed the seeds of witness and growth by way of, by way of the martyrs. You know, William Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah. The seed of the church is the bud of its witnesses. And so, start killing Christians and you will ensure the fact that many people will start coming to Christ. I've thought about that in this congregation. Shoot a few folks and, and who knows how much we could grow, you know. Um, I'm, 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 of course, obviously not serious about that, but by the way, there are people who are serious about that, and that's why a lot of churches have security. <laughs> because there are strange people out there who are, who are serious about this. But the truth is, friends, if you're not excited about much, except you, man, have you missed the cause of Christ in this world. If you are the center of your universe, you have certainly missed what Christ came to do in this world. Missed it. Missed it. One of the great ha hazards of, um, of civilization is that we get to a place where we prefer to drink and party than to live lives that would help uh, civilization. One of the great problems, and, and so every generation, there are, there are Christians who see beyond the obvious personal problems and they say you know what we've got to do like you know Mary Jesus mother and, and her boys and her girls and Peter and the disciples and the apostles and they all gathered in the upper room 120 of them to pray what chance did they have turning an entire Jewish nation that was against and rejecting Christ at least the Sanhedrin council and the leadership was what chance did they have <laughs> to turn that around and to turn a Roman Empire around 
that, by the way, served to murder him on the cross as a criminal. At any point, of course, it was a, it was a, a, a tragedy in terms of justice goes. How, how did they even have a prayer? Because they did pray. That's how they had a prayer. That's how they could work. They simply turned to a power far beyond themselves and they prayed to see what God would do in their midst. Did it work? Did it work? Yes. Had company with a Roman emperor lately? Fearful of the Roman army, are we? You and I both know what happened, don't we? My goodness. My goodness. 120 people in an upper room. Literally. By going to God Almighty's power. Turned the world around. Turned the world around. What can you do? Every generation in this country has had to come to a place of prayer because it looked like things were going simply to hell in a handbasket. And I know you think this is bad right now that we're facing, but folks, how would you like to have been sitting in the middle of the Civil War in 1864, thinking there was no end to this? No end. But there was. God moved. And Lincoln's second inauguration, when he said... Every drop of blood that has been shed by the whip of the master has had to be paid for by the blood of these battles that we have now faced. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. And so people pray. One of the greatest Christian movements in this nation occurred before it was ever a nation. The Great Awakening took place. George Whitfield came across the ocean by sail um, some numbers of times. What sticks in my mind is, is a dozen times, but I'm not sure the number yet. But he came across, it, it took months to come one way. And he came across from, from England over and over again. And do you know why? Because he was an evangelist. <laughs> And he preached in the colonies. And multitudes came to Christ. Do you know how that was fostered? Because of George Whitfield? No. Because people in the colonies began to pray that things would be turned around. And listen, everywhere the Great Awakening happened, everywhere the Great Awakening was preached, where Christ was preached to crowds and crowds and crowds in those colonies, they all of them came to become the independent United States. The Great Awakening only got to Canada too late, or they would have come out along with us from Great Britain. It fostered, it fostered a nation in this world that was one of the only democracies upon the earth at that time. What can happen when people begin to pray? When people begin to witness for Christ's sake? What can happen? Well, we can give up. And we can say, you know, the world's full of nuts with guns and addicts with, with heroin. And who could win all of it? But the truth is, the truth is, it is God who turns nations around. God who fosters what happens in people's lives. Where are you in all this? I'm, I'm afraid that many of us are at a place where we've given up on the power of prayer or we've given up on what God can do. And even though we may be in church, we keep telling ourselves that what we're doing is not important. <laughs> that what we're doing, what people are doing is not important because look, you can't turn the waves, you can't turn the power that's coming against us. But the truth of the matter is, it's always been against us. <laughs> the world's always been barking at our heels. The world's always trying to... to say to us, what you're doing is useless. Um, come, come with me instead of being in church. Let's go wash our cars together. You know, let's go do something really significant for the world. And the truth of the matter, of course, is, as you know and I know, is what is true, a little plaque 
that hung on the wall in my house. I'm, I'm guessing my mother, um, the, the stalwart, forthright Christian uh, in my household, uh, had put on the wall, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. May the empowerment of the Spirit of God, may we get hungry for God Almighty's presence. May we hunger and thirst for what God gives us, for what the Lord has for His people. As we surrender, Lord, to prayer and to power by the Spirit of God, may we also become the witnesses and the martyrs that will make the difference. In the name of Jesus Christ. Forgive our selfishness, our apathy, our sleepiness, our struggle. Forgive us for being so self-centered, but enable us to be motivated by the Spirit of God.